Hey, everyone. If I speak here, does anyone hear me? No. OK. Just checking. OK. How's it going, everyone? Thanks for being here. Um, thank you for the introduction, Wesley. And yes, uh, my name is Cindy. And as I was getting together um, all my ideas for the talk, uh, I really realized that the variety of experiences I've had was kind of like a series of rabbit hole, how I went from behavioral therapy and psychology to stand in front of you delivering a design lecture. So um, we're going to play into the theme of following the rabbit hole. And really what that looked like for me um, in my undergrad career was asking a series of questions. Uh, I always really liked asking why. And it's incredible when you actually get to that level of just like, you ever have a conversation with someone and you're just like, oh, why is that? And then they give you a response and then you go, oh, why is that? And you end up getting a series of pattern out of that answer to really understand what the motivation um, is. So during my undergrad, um, I studied human behavior and social influence and I asked a lot of these questions and it seems kind of like a random conglomerate now that it's all together, but um, I asked, you know, does birth order affect temperament? And that's basically the idea of if you were the firstborn child, middleborn child, uh, youngest child, how does that affect your decision making process? How are your coping mechanisms? How does that lead into the decisions that you have later on in life? Uh, another fun one, and I'll go into this deeper if we have time at the end, um, are facial expressions innate or socially learned? Now, we're very social beings, and we're constantly gathering information from our environment to kind of um, communicate what it is that we need. So um, that's a really fun one that's been debated um, over and over. There still is no finite answer, I should add. Um, and then the last one that I really want to go into deeply with you guys is how do humans conceptualize abstract emotions? So playing on this idea of love, Right? When we think about love, everybody has a different definition for what that looks like. Um, I feel like right now there's a, a good colloquial going around of love language. So everyone communicates what love means to whoever it is they're trying to talk to, whether it's uh, through gifting or acts of kindness or uh, physical affection. There's different ways that we express how we can understand that emotion. So most of what we do is our highest, most sophisticated thoughts are actually rooted in a lot of physical bodily functions. And so there's this idea called embodied metaphors, where it's basically like idioms and sayings that basically try to capture this abstract idea where we can step into it. So it takes something that is so vast and uh, hard to define and makes it more tangible so that we can empathize with it. So, when you think about love, there's all these different things that come up. Uh, two peas in a pod. I'm head over heels in love with this person. We're going our separate ways, right? They're all very physically oriented things in which you can see your body sit in and do. And so it conveys this idea, especially for going separate ways. You know, two people are together and all of a sudden they're not. And they're not going in the straight path anymore. They're going separate. And it takes this thing that you know, you may not exactly understand what it is they're going through specifically, but the idea is so strong because it's a physical phenomenon. And so what happens is abstract emotions end up being like symptoms. So you have something like the common cold. One person can have uh, sniffling and sneezes, and another person may have coughing and a sore throat, but you all fit under this umbrella of the common cold. Right? It's the same diagnoses, and that's what happens with emotions as well. Same thing with anger, with sadness, with happiness. Especially going back to anger, you know, we have different ways of expressing that as well. You can see people who physically exert kind of like this cathartic release, or you have people who just keep to themselves and really internalize. So we all process these things in different ways, but for us to have that mutual understanding, we can communicate it through embodied metaphors. So I was talking about this with my housemate at the time. And I was like, yeah, it's crazy. You know, love is it's a four letter word. It's so simple. But I love watching the sunset. I love my mom. I love my cat. And those are all very different ideas of what that love may mean. But it communicates this level, level of passion, right? Like I really, really care about all those things that I just listed. So she was like, well, you know, love is just one word, but grief actually has seven words for love. And I was like, whoa, you mean to tell me that 
this whole time, I think we were probably in our early 20s at this point, you've had love plus seven other ways to categorize all the different ways you can understand what it is you're feeling. So then it poses this question, do, oh, let me go back a little bit. I'll show you all the examples. So the first one is eros, romantic, passionate love. Right? That's something you probably would feel with a, a romantic partner. There's phila, there's intimate, authentic friendship. Ludos, it's playful, flirtatious love. Storg, unconditional, familial love. Right? That's what I would use to talk about my mom. And uh, Felucia, self-love, which is a term that's, I think, emerging more in our colloquial in this generation, right? This idea of self-love, we can instantly think about, okay, that's something that I do for myself to recharge, whether it's reading or taking walks or whatever it is. <clears throat> There's a, a more well-defined concept and if you take self out of it, it's pretty abstract, but then you add the self in there and suddenly it communicates this very clear method in which you're going to communicate that love. Committed, uh, compassionate love is pragma. And then agape is empathetic universal love. So seven different buckets for this very, very big umbrella emotion, right? So it made me wonder, if she grew up with each of these buckets, right, to categorize one thing as an English speaker that I know of, she has seven different options. So when she's going through each of these experiences, she already has that predispos predisposition of options to say, oh, you know what, I'm feeling this. And so I started to ask, do people with multiple language skills have higher emotional intelligence? If you speak more than one language and there's different ways for you to express that feeling, does that mean that you, you know, have a better idea than somebody who has less of those options? So it turns out that some very, very smart people have already pondered this phenomenon, and they call it linguistic determinism. So this idea is basically what language you predominantly speak has huge effects on how you shape the concepts that you experience in the world. So that makes a lot of sense, right? Uh, it's kind of like this idea of trying to translate poetry. It, it never quite gets there. Or listening to music that's been translated to, or even like uh, dubbed movies, right? Something's always a little bit off that doesn't really get across. So it's really important that this at the crux of language is how we experience things around us. And when it comes down to design, there's some really, really important things that people should have thought about when it comes to language. So these are some examples of ad campaigns that have failed horribly because they've got lost in translation. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with HSBC. Uh, they basically were the number one drug smuggling uh, bank for the cartel. Um, you should look it up if you don't know anything about that. There's a really good Dirty Money episode on it. It's super interesting. So it's a good grounds for rebranding, right? And they ended up translating to do nothing, which is terrible. Um, and similarly with Pepsi and, and KFC, the Chinese translation doesn't really quite get there, right? So you get a lot of things that are lost and you're losing the ability to capture your target market. If you were to understand that, you know, language comes down to the key communication of whatever it is you're running, I think that they would have approached it a lot differently. So after my undergrad, I like uh, seeing people's reactions because I didn't put any uh, context to this, but I'll get into it. So after my undergrad, um, I was asking a series of questions, you know, what it is that I want to research next. And I ended up going to a fungus night at the Academy of Sciences in San Francisco. So they had all these really wonderful experts all over the fungi world, you know, people growing just really insane mushrooms and using it to cure cancer and da da da. So there's this woman named Jaren Lee who runs a company called Coeo, and it's a startup company that's based in Mountain View. And what you're looking at is their product, which is a cotton burial shroud. So when you die, you can get wrapped in the shroud and it's embedded with mushroom spores, and it will eventually decompose your body and your bones and recycle all those nutrients back into the living organisms around you. Pretty far out. Everyone's like quiet, like, whoa, what is that? Yeah, um, it is a really, really revolutionary product. Um, and what's interesting is there's not a lot of 
product development in the funeral business, it's just, it's a monopoly. You know, you're not really getting people who are competing with the next funeral home saying, hey, we have better deals. And uh, it's such a sensitive topic, especially in Western culture. So topics of taboo don't often get that target market uh, addressed. And so what I did for this company was I did a lot of psychographic research. So I conducted a series of interviews of people who were already participants um, using the shroud, whether it was for humans or for pets. Um, and then I investigated what the phenomenon was in the funeral home business, what it was like to be a funeral home owner and to provide the products that people select. And what I found is it's a very tricky thing to tackle. You know, the target market here is people who are dead, but those aren't the people making the decision for what they're gonna be buried in. And a lot of the times, uh, you already have it written in your will, or maybe based on religion or tradition, there's something that's already preset. So it's kind of hard to engage in a target market and try to get them to convert to using a new product, especially something that needs a lot of explanation and challenges really old ideologies. So that was really interesting. That was kind of just like a fun fact. So um, after I did that, I ended up going to behavioral therapy. Um, I got my license in applied behavioral therapy, um, and the shorthand for that is ABA. And the foundation of that form of therapy is really to understand what is the function of our behavior. Every behavior is trying to communicate something. So if we're able to identify what that is, you can address the need a lot sooner. And this is something that, as designers, is kind of like the first stage of ideation, right? You're trying to serve a need to a very specific group of people, and you have to understand and really empathize with what that looks like. So what I learned was that humans are really malleable beings across a cognitive scale. But what I did was I did one-on-one -on -one therapy specifically with clients on the autism spectrum in between the ages of 3 and 15, typically. And whenever we found a behavior that was maladaptive or disruptive, we had to design programs to get them to re- learn how to ask for that behavior. So the four functions of behavior under ABA, the first one is sensory. So this is if you're doing something because it purely just feels good to do. If you've ever gone to the market and just like stuck your hand in a bag of beans or um, digging your toes in the sand, you're just doing it because it physically feels good to do. The second one is escape. So if you are in a really awkward situation um, someone's making you feel comfortable, you want to remove yourself from that, right? Simply, it's undesired, I'm going to leave. Attention. It's literally the reason why babies cry. They don't know any words yet, and they're just crying because they need something. They need your attention to come and address it. And the last one is access to tangibles. And my favorite example of this is like the kid that's throwing a tantrum in the chocolate aisle because their parent just said, no, I'm not going to buy you that chocolate bar. So. That is pretty much how ABA has bucketed the reasons why we do things. Okay, so I'm gonna take a pause there because a lot of people understand that humans are malleable beings. We're constantly influenced uh, on a daily scale, especially now with how fast technology is accelerating. Um, and we're susceptible to a lot of outside influence. And so it's really gotten our ways of consumerism to be faster and faster. There's overproduction, overconsumption, and a great deal of waste to deal with. So I'm pretty sure a lot of you are familiar with those two ideas, right? And those are the things that are driving this accelerated number of acquiring 64 to 68 new pieces of clothing a year half of which are all worn just three times or less, which creates an immense amount of waste. And that 80 pounds of clothing, sorry, 18 tons of clothing every three days, that ends up going to the global south, where then they're, de they're meant to deal with our waste. And they go into resale markets after resale markets. But the truth of the matter is, we're creating things that don't last, that are trendy, so they inherently can't last much longer, that perceived obsolescence. And they end up going to the landfill but they go overseas somewhere else where we can't see. And that's kind of the problem of the cycle is that this kind of information is not apparent in that materials economy. It's drawn out like a linear path when really it should be something that is cyclical. So I would really recommend um, 
watching that video in your spare time. Uh, it's a really good use of your time, and she goes through a number of ways where you can actually um, intercept. And so, <laughs> if you just bought one used item this year instead of a new one, it would save six pounds of CO2 emissions, which is equivalent to maybe half a million cars off the road for a year. That's pretty significant. So there's two ways that I can see us participating in it. And oftentimes I get stuck in the struggle of the burden of knowledge, right? It's a lot to take on. It feels like it's a system that has been in tradition for so long. Where are we supposed to make the impact? So from the bottom up, the number one rule is just to buy less, to slow down and really consider the things that you are consuming. Ask yourself, is this something that I can see myself having for five years, for 10 years? And then, of course, shopping secondhand. And that doesn't mean, you know, just with your clothing. You can buy a lot of the other hard goods that you need in your daily life um, and through uh, many other resources. I'm happy to share all of them. And then talking about this kind of stuff with people around you and asking people, why do you choose to shop the way you do? It starts a really good conversation, and you can keep asking why. And the second is from the top down, which the most effective way I see it is legislation reform. And we all know that politics is a really long, hard game. So the part that we as designers can play into it is systems reform. How do we make things differently? How do we really understand what it is we're putting out into the world? Now, the woman that I worked for, Xu Zhang Bertrand, who started Apply, she had an entire career in industrial design before starting this brand. And the first thing she said to me um, upon me getting hired was, you know, I never actually really understood what was happening with my products. I would make the design, I'd send it out, and I'd get it back. And that was all I really knew, and that I never cared to ask. And so there's many points of intervention here. And I really like what Annie Leonard says about seeing all the connections to the big picture. And the rest of this presentation is really going to focus on how we can all work together to unify these systems. Instead of having them broken down in these linear chunks, how do we get it to all revolve and work with each other, where one person's waste becomes another person's resource? So is anyone familiar with how garment is made? Raise your hand if you have an idea. Okay. What are, what's your opinion or like, what, how do you think clothing is made? Um, well, I mean, as you've stated, uh, you know, pattern is necessary for any garment or bag or things like that. And then um, once that's established, um, you know, they can purchase, you know, do both amounts of fabric necessary. Mm -hmm. And um, still a lot of the labor is done by hand, although there's some people investing into, you know, computational sewing, stuff like that. Okay. Um, and, then, and then there's a lot of other people trying to upcycle those fabrics. And, yeah. yeah. Wow, that was a really, really nice response. That was more than I was expecting. Um, so yeah, you actually got it pretty spot on. Um, but there's all these little factors that go into how and how many the garment industry makes. So you start with a pattern. A pattern is basically the blueprint for all the components that go into a piece of clothing. So if I were to take my coat and chop the sleeve off and then cut it in half and lay it flat, that would be a pattern. So all those pieces laid out on a piece of paper is called the marker. And the marker is used as a stencil to guide the cutting process. And the marker has all these pattern pieces laid out flat, and then it's laid on top of piles of fabric so that it can all be cut out at the same time. So this is a CAD of what a garment industry pattern marker might look like. You can see that it's all separated by sizes based on the color, so extra small all the way to extra large. And the reason why it's beneficial for it to be separated like this is so you can clearly see all the corresponding components that go into a certain size. Now, if you look at this corner right here, the program tells you how much of that fabric is actually utilized. So that means out of this entire surface area that you see, all the colored pieces only make up 61% of what you see. 
all the negative space around it that's white is 38%. That's all the stuff that's going to the landfill. So that's almost, that's 40%, 40% is pretty close to 50%, so what, that's like half of the fabric that's just getting discarded through this process. Now, a lot of people ask, well, can't you puzzle it differently to make it more efficiently? And you can. This is what it would look like if you maximize your surface area. Now, it doesn't say it down here, but this is probably close to around 10%, maybe less than 10% waste, which is really good. 10% is a really good number to aim for. Um, that is significantly lower than the average waste. However, you see all the pattern markers now are scattered. The sizes, like you see large, some over here, some over there, and it makes it really hard to actually account for how many pieces you're going to get. If you print out this marker and you cut out all these pieces, you're going to get an equal ratio across all the sizes, right? The reason why most industries separate it by sizing is because your demand changes, right? Medium might be a more popular size than extra large or extra small. So you're going to pile more sizes onto this production skew rather than the ones at the uh, umbrella edge. So that makes it really difficult for people because when you do it like this, even though you're conserving fabric, you can't just say, okay, I'm going to cut more of the medium pieces because the fabric's going across the whole entire sheet. So there's no way to really compartmentalize your sizes. And that's why this ends up being the industry standard. <clears throat> now, as Wesley mentioned earlier, I work for a company right now called Apla. And we're located in San Francisco. And we're very lucky to be across the street from the factory where we produce at, which we have a great intimate relationship that we foster to kind of change this pattern system. So we make zero waste bags for culinary, for wine, for bread and produce, as well as garden. Um, this is a little bit of a product run through. So this is the plot tote. Uh, it's meant to carry your bowls, your dishes horizontally going to picnics or potlucks. We have a line of zero waste pan covers and dish covers to eliminate single use saran wrap and foil. We make wine carriers for single bottle, double bottle, bread and storage bags for the same reason as the covers, but actually storing your bread and produce in organic cotton uh, preserves them for a lot longer. It lets the vegetables breathe um, while absorbing the moisture. That oftentimes is what makes it wilt faster, especially for leafy greens or mushrooms. Um, this is our garden collection. And all the denim that you see, we actually source from local surplus rolls. So what happens is a company like Levi's, for example, they go through a production run of 5,000 pieces. And at the very end, they have 40, rolls of fabric, or 40 yards of fabric left, which sounds like a lot. But in the scale of 5,000 pieces, you actually can't make anything that you're actually going to sell. So those leftover rolls end up going to trash. And we rescue a lot of that back um, and extend their product life cycle. Um, and this is our flower tote, which actually is the first product that launched the brand. Um, Shu was actually gifting flowers to a friend, and when she got the bouquet back, it was wrapped in this plastic cellophane, and she thought, this is terrible contrast to honoring something that comes from the planet. So she ended up going home and drafting this up, and shortly after that, within a few hours, she had the entire product line. And uh, this happened recently, which was cool. Actually, uh, I showed my boyfriend this, and he was just like, who is that? I'm not going to explain if you don't know. <laughs> so um, as makers, we understand that we have a choice, right? And our choice here is to really take responsibility for the part that we play in pre-consumer waste. If we have a way to manage the waste that we create, then that is our ultimate goal. And how we achieve this is by using origami principles and using golden ratios and geometry. What that means is basically taking one sheet, much like you do with a piece of paper, and building folds through volume. And the golden ratios plays into it because when you try to do a zero waste marker, it's kind of like tetrising everything together. And it works best when all those rectangle dimensions are ratioed to one another. One second. Okay, so this piece that I'm holding up makes this product, this product, and this product. 
So we're able to take one rectangle and fold it into three different things to maximize the use of just one simple marker. So like I mentioned before, the key is in the marker. And this is a photo of what our marker looks like. My day-to-day -day job as operations manager here is to be in the factories and work really closely with the production line. So, and that starts mostly in the CAD stage of the marker. Now you may think you have rectangles and squares. Why does it take so much time? Well, it's because, like I mentioned earlier, the demand is always changing. So based on how many units we want to yield, you always have to shift what goes on the piece of paper. And so you really, it's a very complicated process to explain, but I think the visuals will really help. This is an example of what our CAD marker looks like. It's five rectangles. I could show you a bunch of other ones. Uh, this is for the bread line, um, but you get the point, right? It's all right angles and straight edges that line up. And that's the only way you can get virtually close to zero because you have things that totally match. With clothing, it's really hard because it's organic shapes, right? We have curves, butts, elbows, and armpits. So it's nearly impossible to really use this method when it comes to clothing, unfortunately. So I'll give it a second. It's all over the place. So this is basically what the process of laying down fabric looks like. You start with a pretty much like a 20-foot long table. And this roll is on one cylinder that goes back and forth and back and forth. And each of those layers of fabric we lay down is called a ply. And every time the fabric comes back to fold, we call that the return. So the reason why we do so much work uphand in the marker is that you'll always yield some kind of waste in those returns. So again, this is the stack right here. The more markers you have, the more returns you'll have, right? If you have three different pieces, now you, all of a sudden you have six, two per piece. So what we do is we try to fit everything on one big long marker so that there's only just two at the very end. And unfortunately, there's always waste that comes from that because when you actually make the cut with the guide, you have to cut off the axis to make sure that everything lines up. So what we've done is because we don't have any packaging for our products, we use those ribbons to tie our products for retail. And at the very end, I'm gonna just play this again so you can see. After he lays down all the different colors, he's gonna go and put the marker on top. You're probably seeing about 50 plies or so of fabric. It's pretty thick. And in the next slide, I'll show you how he cuts that out. He has this really fun yardstick that he kind of like goes through and smacks it all down. And then there's these big weights that go across the marker so that the stacks are all flat without wrinkles. So you can kind of see that's what the table looks like when it extends out. And he's using basically a bandsaw to cut through it. It's, it's a really cool thing. And I feel like you hardly ever get to see behind the scenes of this process, um, mostly because it's out of respect to um, the clients that are at the factory. But I feel like this is just really important for you all to see because it's hard to conceptualize what the process really looks like if you don't have an example. So this is the only product we make that doesn't have right angles or straight edges. And it's our covers collection. They're all bowls. So what we've done is we fit squares and triangles into the negative space. And those become party garlands. You probably notice I'm in the majority of these photos. You wear a lot of hats when you work for a small business. Um, and you probably noticed in here, there's these tiny little slivers that are Vs. And they come out to be about this big in person. That, unfortunately, we can't do anything with. So what we do is we upcycle it with a company called Phoenix Fibers in Arizona. And what they do is they collect cotton and denim pre-consumer waste, which is all the waste from production that, doesn't, that is not seen by the consumer crowd. They take all of that and they upcycle it into different insulation material for walls, uh, automotives, uh, and a lot of prison mattresses as well. So it's super, super cool. So, We've accounted for this entire cyclical system of our materials economy. And what we're really trying to do is close the loop in this production cycle because it doesn't have to be something that is linear. 
And it starts with our design process, right? Those two products that you saw, the bowl covers and the flags, they were designed at the same time. The waste was never an aftermath for us to deal with. When we're in the initial <coughs> prototyping stage, we think about all the things that are gonna go into what that product yields. So we see the waste before it actually is waste, and we try to do something with it ahead of time. We also don't use any hardwares, um, so no zippers, no buttons, which really helps elongate the life cycle. Um, it also makes it easier for repair, which is something that we're trying to establish towards the, maybe the summer. We're gonna launch a series of workshops um, for people to come and have skills to be able to repair a lot of their items, not just their applause stuff, but home goods, backpacks, anything like that. Um, and we're hoping to also launch an artist residency program. So I'll tell you more about that at the end. So this is kind of an idea of how fabric biodegrades. Right now we're using 100% organic cotton, and with the right composting, it can actually be gone in a week to five months, which is really, really cool. And as you go down the list, these are all natural organic materials, right? Linen comes from flax, wool comes from sheep, bamboos, self-explanatory, silkworms. So these are the common products that we actually used to use in our clothing back in our grandparents' generation. So this is a really awesome resource from Closed Loop Economy. Um, and it basically goes through how organic fiber interacts with man-made fiber. And so what you have over here are some of those fibers that I listed on the page before. You have your proteins, which is material that's harvested from some kind of livestock. And then you have the plant-based stuff up there, which is you know, your hemp, jute, flax, cotton. Um, and then on the red side is all man-made materials. So that's anything from rayon to polyester to nylon, all these different things that basically are petroleum and oil-based, which is one of the largest polluting industries in the world. So this is what polyester looks like on a chemical level. It's thermoplastic, which means it can be heated up to be reshaped. It's hydrophobic, which means it doesn't absorb any water. It takes about 200 years to <laughs> decompose. Okay, so earlier uh, before the lecture started, I asked a few students in the front to share with me um, your fabric contents. Um, the people that I asked, could you raise your hand and also share it with, yeah. Wait, did you want me to share the one or both? Both, okay. both is fine. Uh, well, this shirt is cotton and polyester and it was 10% polyester. Okay, 90% cotton? Yeah. Okay, mixed blends. Um, what about you, Ryan? Hundred percent polyester. Okay, so I started asking, working in the factory every day, how come we can't get the garment clients who also share a factory to be able to upcycle a lot of their fabric? Well, it's because most of the fibers they use are mixed, so you get a lot of the synthetics that are mixed with natural cottons that usually could decompose. But now all of a sudden, because it's interwoven with something that is man-made, you're never be able to separate it. It's like if you're using red and blue to make purple, once you get to purple, you can't go back to either of those colors, right? And it's the same idea. It's woven into a thread, which then is woven into the fiber, which becomes the fabric for the clothing. So there's really no industrial process to separate a lot of this. So that's why a lot of this just ends up going to landfill, because people don't really have a system for properly separating it yet. So I started asking, well, then where does it all go? Right? Because every single day, we see bales and bales of fabric moving out. And it's all from the pre-consumer cuts from these garment industries. And so in San Francisco, our waste management system is called Recology. <coughs> Recology is probably one of the most state-of-the-art waste management systems, definitely in North America. Um, and what they've done is basically revolutionize the way that our city thinks about waste. Now, I was really lucky to run into the PR manager there. Uh, his name is Robert Reed, and he has an impressive history in journalism, and he's been with Ecology for 19 years. And so I started asking him all these questions, right, because I'm a rabbit hole person. And I was like, hey, Robert, I'm just wondering, when you pick up this fabric, what happens to it? And he pretty much gave me the same answer. And he was like, you know what I'm gonna tell you? A smart person tries to recycle fabric. 
a wise person avoids it altogether. And so it was kind of a dead-ended thing because he basically said, you know, we don't have it figured out because it's a problem that keeps persisting. And Recology does all kinds of collections, not just on a residential level, but they go around to commercial spaces like hotels, restaurants, all of which have a variety of different fabric <coughs> waste um, that often has hardware. So there's buttons, zippers, strings, all kinds of things that you don't really know what to do with. So right now at the moment, I think he ensued. It's going to landfill. I haven't really confirmed it, and that literature isn't available, so that's my disclaimer. But I ended up asking more questions. You know, what else are you guys doing with the waste? And so he was able to tell me some really, really incredible things about what Recology does. Every single day, Recology picks up 650 tons of recycling, 80% of which is all fiber material, which means it's cardboard and paper that can be recycled back into new products. So there is an industry that exists with taking waste and recommodifying it and making it resources for a new product. What Recology has revolutionized is 800 tons of compost a day, which is 150 tons more than recycling, which is 800 tons more that's leaving landfills and going to a different cause. And so composting is something that's mandated by our city. And every single house, whether it's residential or commercial spaces, is required to have compost, which is why they have such a great yield. And I asked him, how did you get such a great number? Because this program was only launched within the last 10 years. And he said, the big part was we got city legislation on board. After the mandate happened, we just put out so much literature. We gave people free bins, resources to really understand it. And then we have a purpose for people to actually compost floor. So what Recology has done is they're working with all the vineyards in Sonoma County to grow mustard as cover crops. Now, what happens when you go through a typical harvest season is that you're planting all these things that you want to be nutrient dense because a lot of those things are things we're going to put back into our own bodies. So you put the best of the materials into the plant food, the plant eats it, and then we eat the plant. And so after harvest season, the soil has been completely degraded of all those nutrients. And you plant winter cover crops so that those nutrients can be re-sowed into the ground. So right now what Sonoma County is doing is they're growing rows of mustard in between all the vineyards. And mustard is a magic cover crop. It absorbs so much CO2 emissions that it's said that it could probably help with 20% reduction in California's emissions alone annually. What happens is mustard roots can actually grow to be about six feet deep, which is taller than most of us. And the deeper the roots, the deeper that it can sow that CO2, which is great because plants love carbon dioxide. It also pulls nitrogen back in, and those two components are the most important for plant nutrients. So a lot of that is the biomass, which is the food source for these plants to really thrive. But additionally, the mustard is kind of a symbiotic thing with the vineyards because what happens is you get these soil-borne pests. And they're basically these worms called nematodes. <coughs> and nematodes basically end up eating the thing that you want to not be eaten. And so because mustard is so high in biofumigants, it's kind of like a spicy, repugnant taste to these worms, and the worms leave it alone. So now you have a pest problem that is being handled without using any kind of herbicides or pesticides. And you're feeding your plants. And you're taking all of that resource that originally came from someone else's waste, which is incredible. And California actually has vowed to be carbon neutral by 2045. And so there's an immense amount of funding that's going into uh, motivating California agriculture to basically plant as many cover crops as they can to try to reduce CO2 emissions. This is a picture of my friend Scott. Uh, he and I taught a permaculture class together at UC Santa Cruz. And this is his farm. This is the pictures from his first season. He uses the compost from Recology. And those are his chrysanthemum flowers as well as um, goldie greens. And those are really great cover crops for him going throughout this. And these are a variety of Asian heritage vegetables he grows for uh, Asian restaurants and markets in Marin County. And this is Slide Ranch, which is a wonderful educational farm that's pretty close to Stinson Beach on Highway 1. So you get all this local waste that's coming from one industry being married and recommodified to help another industry. 
And I think that's really what Annie Leonard was getting down to about unifying and seeing all the connections along the way. And as designers, we play a huge part in this because we're the ones now putting things out into the world. And we have the power to also redefine systems and how we make those products. Recology's system was designed by somebody. You know? So what I'm hoping you'll do is maybe you can get together with the folks at your table and kind of go off of the information that I've given you about how Recology works with compost um, and cover crops and think about what that would mean in Long Beach. I found out earlier that Long Beach doesn't have a mandated composting system, but that the campus has been trying. And so I want, to use, I want you guys to use the marker pads to just jot down some quick visuals with the facts that you've learned, and I can go back a few sheets. But why should the Long Beach community care about composting? You know? So take a few minutes, talk to the people at your tables, um, and I'll go back to the mustards page so you can see. So I, did I miss anyone out there? OK, cool. So you guys can keep talking, but I'm just going to summarize a little bit of what I heard as I was popping around. Um, most of the barriers that were identified were lack of education, whether that's um, you're not really sure what can be composted and what's not. There's some kind of um, discretion there. Um, and the second one was time and resource, right? Long Beach doesn't have a composting pick up. So a lot of the times when you're composting at home, the questions come up to where do you actually take it, um, the smell, the uh, time it takes for it all to break down. So these are all really good things to take into account too. And what I collected in my data surveying is that this stuff has been designed into Recology system. And so what you guys all just helped me realize is Coming from San Francisco, we live in a bubble where our behavior has been trained to really understand composting as like a, a second impulse, right? It's the same way that we don't really think about separating recycling anymore. We've been doing it for so long that we don't really have to stop and ask this question. And that five second delay makes a really big difference for whether you're motivated to sort it or not. Um, so yeah, that was definitely something that was super interesting. Um, just talking about composting um, and realizing like what compost material actually is, um, what is the process of compost breakdown, and then where does it go afterwards. So um, what's interesting is because I never realized I live in a bubble until I leave San Francisco, because <laughs> everyone in San Francisco is all trained on the same system, right? Recology's got it like wired down. And so for us, it's like, oh yeah, cover crops, this and that. Um, and the reason why I had you guys write all this down is because Robert Reed at Recology, um, they're really trying to expand their branch. Um, I was telling Wesley earlier that they've gone up to San Rafael, which is the county that's directly north of the Bay. Um, and they've gone down onto the peninsula in San Mateo County as well. And they're really trying to launch some stuff down in Southern California. And so I'm going to collect all these sheets and hopefully feed it back to him and give him some feedback about um, what kinds of stuff needs to be done. So thank you guys very much for participating in a study. Um, OK, so I wanted to end it um, with kind of closing out this talk with questions that I want you guys to continue asking. The best piece of advice I ever got when I was going through um, figuring out what I wanted to do with my efforts was, what do I think about when I don't have anything I have to think about? And that's a really interesting question because I don't know if it's automatic for us to track where our mind wanders. But I'm posing this question because if you follow that, you'll really get to the core of what your true passions are. And if you just keep asking questions and track and catalog those questions for yourself, you'll really understand what you want to move towards. And that will really help your design process and guide you to the step that you want to go. Um, what's really important is you guys are all really talented. And you have so many resources, more than people in the generation that I'm in or the people above us had when we were your age. And you're the next generation of problem solvers. And so along the way, you're going to be the touch point of all these systems that really need our help, whether it's through a product or for an actual systems design. So try to write to yourself. Um, this is a fun study, too. So um, there was a study that was done on college students. 
and the control group um, basically was asked to write a journal entry for 15 minutes a day for just seven days about <coughs> what events happened external in the world. So the weather was nice today. In the news, this happened. I learned this in class. That's it. And the variable group was asked to write all those things, but then reflect on how those external factors made them feel internally. So the weather was nice today, so it lifted my mood because I'm happier when the sun is out. This happened in the news and it made me sad because it made me realize that this is the state of the world that we're in. So those two groups, even though they're talking about the same things, one processes how those factors made them feel. And then they tested how many times the students went to the student health center over the course of a semester. And they found significant decreases in the students that wrote about external matters and reflected internally about how it made them feel. So this communicates that when we're able to process and have this phase of reappraisal, which is thinking about something that we experienced and trying to recontextualize it, we can really start to shape the way that we initially felt that. Right? It's like if someone spilled coffee on me because they're in a rush, I get really upset because now I show up to the presentation I'm about to give and I'm covering coffee. But then later on, you know, I get over it, I change my clothes, and I'm like, that wasn't a big deal. I'm not mad anymore. Maybe that person was in a rush or whatever it was. And we've learned to let it go. That's why we're not constantly mad, right? We're, we're adjusting the way that we see the world. And it's really important to do that with writing. And when you do that, you can really start to get to the core of your own behavioral pattern. So that is what I leave you all with. And uh, if you guys have any questions, um, is now a good time, Wesley? OK, cool. <laughs> You guys don't have any, okay, hey. Uh, we were looking on your company's website and we noticed a lot of the products that you sell are really expensive. So how do you overcome the boundary of the cost? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. So um, as she was mentioning, um, our products are probably based in between $30 to $50. The highest price point we have is $100 for the big market tote. Um, and that actually is a huge barrier um, we run into all the time. Um, people want to support the products that we have, but the financial incentive is kind of hard. And being in San Francisco, it's kind of a, a it's an affluent community that can afford some of those products. Um, but when you take it outside of that community, again, leaving the bubble, um, that financial matter really becomes a barrier. So what we've done is try our best to communicate the values in which we operate our uh, design process by. If we can explain to people and get them to really understand, this is the amount of time that goes into making this product. This is the amount of money that goes into getting a resource that was harvested in the United States. This is what happens when you actually make your products across the street from where you work in San Francisco. And that is the true cost. So our cogs are higher because we make all these choices. And I think the best we can do is communicate the value of why we make those choices. Any other questions? How would you go about inviting Long Beach to use compost? And uh, would, it be, would the strategy be more uh, top down or bottom up or both? I think. <clears throat> Personally, and also because I've gathered some of the responses, I think the best way would be from top down because the main barrier is you could have a compost, but what do you do with it afterwards, right? If there is no waste management facility that's actually coming through and helping you collect that waste, um, it doesn't really provide an incentive, right? It, it creates more labor for people, which is not really um, a driver. So um, I think that if Recology were to approach it or if I were to approach it on a personal level, it would be trying to get the city on the same page. Um, you can actually participate in a lot of like local legislation groups, and you can sign petitions that say, you know, we want this to be mandated. If you get enough next signatures, it'll get on a ballot. People can vote on it, and then things will change. So that's a really nice bottom-up level that I think a lot of people overlook. Um, participating in local politics <coughs> is something that you'll probably have the biggest effect on what directly touches you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
was hearing about how like a lot of your car products are alternatives to like single-use plastics and also like the you're talking about like holding workshops regarding repairs so you can hold on to an object longer mm -hmm. basically building towards like this ideal like one-time purchase mm -hmm. uh, does that you think contradict kind of like a business goal of selling more things yeah it's the ultimate double-edged sword right we want people to buy less stuff um, and we want to make it really well so it lasts forever so yeah it, we make a, a pretty big challenge for ourselves because we're constantly reaching out to new customers um, which you know you get across your values but then you figure out okay what are the other things that I need to address right there's this uh, concept called wicked problems um, and it's basically a problem that has so many different facets that if you change one, it'll ultimately create a problem somewhere else. And so it kind of is like a domino effect where you can't, kind of, you can't really fix the problem all at once unless you, you know, erase the whole thing and start over, which isn't really how the world works. Um, so yeah, by choosing those as our values, we're then now focusing um, a lot of our energy on different kinds of campaigns, community engagements. Um, yeah, new, new customers constantly. <laughs> What's your thought on like using 3D printing in, or, or using tools that create, in a sense, more waste, but in a way to uh, to fix your pre-existing uh, products, items, things, so that you're not just throwing something out. And you're able to like actually repair what you have and fix, um, even though you are like making like a tiny little part. Mm, okay, I want to go back to how you started that question, which was um, 3D printing creates waste. So if you're creating a part that is a, a component for fixing another thing, it's an additive process. Also, why 3D printing is awesome is it's an additive process. Right? Most things like garment production or wood cutting, it's all reductive. You start with something that's finite and you reduce it to the dimension you actually want. 3D printing is awesome because it's the full opposite of that. You build to what you need, so you actually don't really have a waste, especially if you're making that for something else. Right. Did right. I get your question? Yeah. Okay. I guess I was thinking more of like because of the materials that you use, mm -hmm. or in general, um, that are not generally. I don't. Or do they have recycl or recyclable 3D prints? Yeah. Yeah. If you guys are ever in New York, uh, Cooper Hewitt has a wonderful exhibit on this entire, like, oh my gosh, there's this really cool industry that's taking off where they use repurposed materials. Like you can 3D print with algae. Um, yeah, it's really cool. Um, and I, I think Adidas launched something recently where they take a lot of um, their old soles and they'll basically convert it into um, the, the thing, the material, whatever it is. I don't know what it's called because then it, it's like, it was p plastic petroleum, but then it gets converted into something else. But um, yeah. I definitely think there's a lot of people out there who are doing alternative material resourcing, and that is a super cool thing to get into. You know, That's probably the future. Do you know if there's any like school material or like filaments or anything like that? Been yeah, um, none that I can name off the top of my head, but algae, okay. fully compostable, right? That's a bio material. Um, yeah, there's all kinds of things. There's people who extract uh, silkworm enzymes and then they mix it with like moon jelly DNA and they can make like glow in the dark material and 3D print from that. It's super cool. Yeah. yeah. Anything else? Okay. Right. Cool. Cindy, thank you so much for coming down. We really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Thank you guys for all being here.